Welcome. Chapter 1, Section 3, Evaluating Limits Analytically. And we are on day two, so we'll be looking at the squeeze theorem today. Also, we need to look at what to do if we have complex fractions. Um, so number four picks up at that. Simplify the complex fraction. That's a technique that we can use when we end up with the zero over zero scenario, that indeterminate style. And if you notice here, if I plug in zero, I would have one third minus one third. That would give me zero on top. If I put in uh, zero for x, I get zero on the bottom. So let's take care of that and flip back here. What I need to do, I would love to make this upper one one fraction. How do I join them together? Well, by making the lowest common denominator, or finding that, and I would say the lowest common denominator for this would be 3 times x plus 3. So that's what I need to make. Let's take and multiply this first fraction by 3 over 3. And let's take this fraction and multiply it by x plus 3 over x plus 3. When I do that, that's going to give me the limit as x approaches 0 of 3 over 3 times x plus 3 minus 1 over 3, I'm sorry, that's x plus 3 over 3 times x plus 3, all over the denominator of x. Now let's just work on simplifying this. So my next step would look like the limit as x approaches infinity or in, approaches zero. Three on top minus this negative will apply to each of those. So I'd have a negative x and a negative three over the common denominator three x plus three all over x. Simplify one more step and I would have, let's scroll this, the limit as x approaches 0. On top it's going to be negative x over 3 times x plus 3. Multiply, think of this as being over 1. So I've got a complex fraction, numerator, denominator, numerator, denominator. Multiply by the reciprocal, change the division to multiplication. Now it appears that this x can cancel that x. That brings me to my next line, the limit. As x approaches 0, I'd have negative 1 on top and 3 times x plus 3 on the bottom. Plug in 0 and I am going to have negative 1 over 3 times 3. Looks like we get an answer of negative 1 ninth. Those are fun. Next one, simplifying trig functions. Um, this technique also can be used when you encounter 0 over 0. And the thing I remember about cotan, let's just say we got to remember what cotan is um, also equivalent to. And that would be cosine x over sine x. What I think it's, I'm going to do a little bit of switching up then on this. Let's just try that. Why am I doing that? Well, I should explain that, shouldn't I? Cosine of pi over 2 is 0. And the cotan of pi over 2 would be the cosine of pi over 2, which is 0 over 1. So I end up with the denominator being 0. So I'd have 0 over 0, and that's an indeterminate form. So let's try an alternate method, see if we can't rewrite that fraction that we're looking at there. And we'd have cosine x over cosine sine x. Similar idea as last time, let's multiply by the reciprocal because we're dividing by that fraction. So I'd have cosine of x, I could say over 1, multiplied by the reciprocal sine x over cosine x. Now my cosines cancel away to make 1, and I'm left with the limit as x approaches pi over 2 of sine 
ducks. Plug in your pi over 2, and we'd have sine of pi over 2. Now just think back to your lovely unit circle. The value of sine of pi over 2 sits up at the top of our unit circle that has a value of 1, and that is the answer to the problem. Next up, if you have that reference sheet, you might want to look at that. I think it's the green one that I gave you, and it has some of those trig identities on it. That might be handy to use for this sine of 2x. So we'll push that away. Let's go into this one. Okay, the limit as x approaches 0. If I put in 0 for x, I don't have 20, but I'd have 2 times 0. The sine of 0 is 0, so I'd have 0 over 0. Indeterminate form means let's try to change the look of this. And the way we can change the look of this particular one is take the limit as x approaches 0 of x times 2 sine x cosine x. You'll find that on that trig reference sheet all over sine x. Makes it into a nice problem because we can um, cancel the sine x's. Leaves us with the limit as x approaches 0 of x times the 2 times the cosine of x. As this approaches 0, we'd have 2 times 0 Oops, times cosine of 0. I don't even really care what cosine of 0 is because anything times 0 is going to be 0. The limit is 0. If I put in 0 in this one, I would have 1 minus the cosine of 0 is 1 over 0. This gives me 0 over 0 once again. Um, looking at this problem, I do not see an easy way of transforming that numerator into something that's going to allow me to cancel the denominator. And that's really what I need to have happen is the x's cancel. So on this one, I think I'm going to resort to just the graphing technique. And here is a picture of the graph. It may not have shown up real great on your copy. And you may want to just you know draw that in by hand. So as we approach 0, as x approaches 0, coming into 0 from the left and from the right, that means I'm following this function, dot, 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 dot. Looks like it's coming into a height of 0, and this one's coming into dot, 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 a height of 0. This appears to have 0 as its limit. Next, we're going to consider evaluating limits um, using one-sided limits where we analyze both the left hand and the right hand side independently of each other and then use that to conclude whether the limit at the value exists or not. So as we come in to see from both the left and the right, we'll determine if the limit exists. Often these are used on piecewise functions as well to look at it from the left side as well as the right side. All right, so here we go. When I see absolute values, I can rewrite this absolute value sign using a piecewise function. So just focusing solely on the numerator. We're going to look just at the numerator of ways to rewrite this. Well, what I know, and I'm going to look at it um, from a number line point of view. So there's my 4. Well, let's say here's 0. When I put in a number larger than 4, and let's grab a highlighter here. When we put in a number larger than 4, when we're headed this way, this would be positive, wouldn't it? So anything bigger than 4 gives me a positive value. That allows me to say that x minus 4, when x is greater than or equal to 4, that this would represent um, the absolute value of x minus 4. So say I put in 5. 5 minus 4 would be 1, and I don't need to really take the absolute value of it because it's already positive. However, when I move to the left side of this, let's get back to that highlighter and take it to green. When I'm over here on the left side, and I use a number from the left side of it, 
then I need to do the absolute value because I've got to turn this expression positive. So let's just pick a number. Let's say we chose the number negative 3. When I put negative 3 in, it gives me negative 7. In order to make this absolute valued, I really need to add another negative, don't I? So I need the opposite of negative 7, which would take me back to positive 7, and that would be equivalent to the absolute value of negative 7. So on this piecewise, when I break this out, I need a negative out front to make it the opposite um, sign, and that would occur when any time that x is smaller than 4. So I've just been able to piecewise out this um, absolute value function by thinking about when is it always positive and when is it going to be negative for what values of x and that we've got defined so we've just wrote this piecewise function. How does that help me? Well now I'm going to take and look at the limit from a right hand perspective and a left hand perspective and then I can determine if indeed a limit exists overall. So from the right hand side I'd be looking at the limit as x approaches 4 from the right. And when that is the case, I'm in this scenario here. So I can take my rewrite of the absolute value. All I need is x minus 4 really on top. And then I'd have the x minus 4 denominator that's always there. Well, this is same over same, isn't it? So this would cancel away, leaving me 1. And so from the right-hand side, my limit is 1. Now let's go consider the left-hand side. So the left-hand approach would say the limit. As x approaches 4 from the left, and my numerator now, when I'm less than 4, I'm falling in this rule category. So here is what I need to put in. Instead of using my absolute value sign, I'm going to use the opposite of the expression because that turns things back to positive. When I do this, I notice that I can cancel the x minus 4 with the x minus 4. It leaves me a 1 there, but I have this negative out front, so my answer is negative 1. Now, what I want to do is pull this together and look at the limit as 1. So the limit as x approaches 4 from the left end and the right hand side of the function f of x or my absolute value function there, I just kind of shortcutted writing it, would be 1 and negative 1, which means that the left side does not agree with the right side, and we get a does not exist scenario. Uh, let's see if I do have a picture of this. Aha, there it is. Here's the number 4, and you can see from the left hand side, the um, value is negative 1 from the right hand side, it's positive 1, and the limit does not exist right there at 4. Next problem. Another piecewise function, this one is not though a um, absolute value one, but it does have things going on when I'm less than 1 or less than or equal to 1 and when I'm greater than 1. So let's once again look from the right hand side and we'll look from the left hand side. So from the right hand side I would have the limit as x approaches 1 from the right, so plus sign, of this function. You know what, rather than doing that, let me take that f off and let's actually write our function. The function that I need to follow when I'm coming in from the right hand side would be 3x. There we go. And that would turn out to be 3 times 1. I'm just going to try and use substitution of my c value, which was 1. And that gives me a value of 3. From the left hand side, I'd have a left hand limit. Let's put an F in there, left hand. So the limit as x approaches 1 from the left. Now, when I'm smaller than 1, it says use this rule, right? Piecewise function 4 minus x squared. Popping in 1 uh, would be 1 squared, and that would be 3 also. Ooh, this is lovely. Notice how the left hand and the right hand agree. So together, when I pull this information together, I get the limit. As x approaches 1 of the function f of x, 
to be three and three, left and right agree, therefore a limit exists, it's three, here's the picture. Quadratic coming into it, linear leaving it, they agree, they match up at that value of three. Okay, this one, evaluate analytically. Um, the limit. The only thing I can see that we could possibly do would be to rewrite this, x minus 1, x plus 1, because it was a difference of squares. Now, we could cancel, couldn't we? could cancel one of those off so that would take care of the squaring. However, when I use substitution, I'm still left with um, a negative 1 going in there, and I, I can't. I'm going to get 0. I could break this thing off into left hand and right hand side where I, uh, you know, take and analyze it from the left of one, negative 1. That would give me a negative value. So on top I would have x minus 1 over x plus 1, the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the left. And that would be a negative value on top, and it would be a negative value on the bottom giving me some sort of positive. However, I know that negative 1 does not exist. I'm expecting, I know there's a vertical asymptote here. So vertical asymptote probably will result in an unbounded behavior, and that would give us a does not exist for this limit because we are going to go into unbounded. So just jot that down. And let's take a quick peek at the graph. And I think we'll convince ourselves, yes. From one side, it's going up to positive infinity. From the other, it's going to negative infinity. This limit does not exist. Squeeze theorem. Um, notice the words in the very beginning of this. Very important to read this. We have three functions identified, h, f, and g. And they are ordered out so that we can tell which is the larger of the functions g of x is larger than f of x, which is larger than h of x. In an open interval containing c, except possibly c itself, um, and we also know that h of x and g of x approach the same number, have the same limit l, when headed towards c, the x value of c. So that's interesting. This would have a limit of l, and this has a limit of l. By the squeeze theorem, then, we can say since f of x is a function that has values between h of x and g of x, if these two are headed to the height of L, then this two must also be headed to the height of the limit L. And this picture hopefully exhibits that as well. g of x was the top function, always the greater function it shows. h of x was the lowest function, so it's always below the other two. f is the middle function it's riding between them. As x approaches c, they had um, a limit value of l, so its height here was l. Notice that g and h, if they approach l, f has to by the squeeze theorem. It's squeezed into there. Think of like three people going through a doorway. That middle person is squeezed between the outer two. Theorems that you just have to memorize are here. This one, the sine of x over x equals 1. As x heads to 0, and this one, it is headed to 0. The, or its limit is 0. 1 minus cosine x over x. Please commit those to memory. So memorize these. Why don't you write that down? Because you'll probably need to know those for a test when you hit problems that involve this. This one especially is, a, is often used in the AP test. All right, how do we use them? Well, I'm going to stop here and pick this up in the next video.